It's Thursday, December 15th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, the interplay between science fiction and real-world scientific innovations, from space travel to fusion energy. Plus, a replay of a classic Cool Stuff Ride Home segment on Krampus, with an update on some risque depictions of the Yuletide rogue that have been making the rounds online this year. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. Earlier this week, I discussed the U.S. Department of Energy's announcement that a federal lab has achieved net gain in a nuclear fusion energy reaction for the first time, something heralded as a major breakthrough. You can listen to my previous episodes for more information on exactly what happened and why it both is and isn't exciting. But today, I want to take a more cultural approach with a tee-up from Maya Phillips in the New York Times about how popular culture, especially science fiction, has primed us to be excited for the possibilities of fusion. Phillips writes, quote, The news about trying to harness literal star power the likes of which Hollywood could only dream stirred great hopes because, if replicated and controlled, it could one day provide a bountiful source of carbon-free energy. If that sounds like science fiction, well, that's because we've been amply primed for this discovery in pop culture, where alternative versions of our present and fantastical imaginings of our future have shown us impossible technologies powered by some combination of special effects and incomprehensible jargon." End quote. Phillips then goes on to list movies that have featured fusion energy, like the Mr. Fusion Home Energy Reactor that helps take Doc Brown to the wondrous year of 2015 in Back to the Future, and Dr. Octavius's ill-fated fusion reactor in Spider-Man 2, and of course Tony Stark's arc reactor in the Marvel Comics and Cinematic Universe. While the word fusion and some vague scientific concepts get thrown around, the main points of fusion as shown in pop culture portrayals tend to be, quote, the symbol of an alternate reality in which energy and possibilities, superheroic or otherwise, are limitless, end quote. The point of fusion energy and these bigger franchises is not to teach us technically about fusion. As Phillips shares, quote, No matter how many times I watch my favorite sci-fi films and series, I still can't tell a parsec from a cylinder of drugstore plutonium, end quote. No, the point of fusion in pop culture is to encourage us to dream and to get us used to the idea of this being our reality. Recently, I started listening to a 2019 Washington Post podcast series called Moonrise, written and hosted by Lillian Cunningham, who also did their presidential series, one of my personal favorites. It devotes one episode to each U.S. president. Moonrise is about why the U.S. went to the moon. Not because it is hard, but really, politically, philosophically, scientifically, diplomatically, why did we go to the moon? I'm only a few episodes in, but one recurring theme so far is the influence of science fiction writers on the actual science and perhaps even policy decisions that eventually got us to the moon. And when I read Phillips' piece about fusion in contemporary pop culture, it made me think about a point made by Howard McCurdy, a professor and expert in U.S. space policy. On Moonrise, he told Cunningham, quote, Anytime you get a new policy, it's invariably preceded by a culture shift. The people think about something one way, and then they change the way they think about it. End quote. Now, I've thought about this a lot in terms of civil rights, for example, over the years, but not as much in terms of technology and the natural world. McCurdy gave the example of the policy decision to create a national park system, saying, quote, our original impression of the forest is that it was a place you didn't go at night. The grim fairy tales, savage wilderness, a dangerous place. That started to change with works like Walden's Pond and the Hudson River School painting. It took 100 years to create a culture shift between viewing wilderness as savage and viewing wilderness as beauty. And that laid the foundation for a national park movement. You couldn't have had Yosemite National Park, and you couldn't have had Yellowstone National Park. Same thing happens in space. End quote. 
We started getting novels and short stories about humans going to space as early as the mid-19th century, with Jules Verne's From Earth to the Moon. But for a long time, they were fantastical, or adventure-focused. They were light on the actual science. In the way that many of the examples Phillips listed above are light on the actual science of fusion. You know, I don't have any clue how a Mr. Fusion home energy reactor converts food waste into 1.21 gigawatts to travel through time, and I'm pretty sure Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale didn't give it much thought either. And a lot of early space-focused stories were equally vague on how their human explorers actually got to and survived in space. Space, as Cunningham describes it, was the new setting for adventure stories, in books, in movies, in radio shows, taking over the mantle from where westerns had started to feel passé. With much of the U.S. West now settled around the 1920s, the cowboy fantasy was fading. So producers of media took the same character archetypes and narrative beats and plopped them into outer space. There was nothing realistic about the adventures of these space cowboys, however. No explanation of the science and technology they utilized or encountered. But that changed in the 1930s, when a group of writers decided to add the actual science to their stories. And while most of those stories wouldn't break through to the mainstream, except in some film adaptations that stripped a lot of the meticulously researched science from them, they would have a huge niche impact. As Alec Nevela Lee, author of the book Astounding, which I just started reading and which goes into all of this more at length, told Cunningham, quote, Most readers of Western fiction didn't become cowboys, but a lot of people read science fiction and became scientists. End quote. And some of those scientists went on to work for NASA, or its many contractors, and eventually helped us get to the moon. Fusion energy, in much more realistic detail, exists in countless sci-fi novels today, and I'm sure it's inspired many of the younger folks who are working at the nuclear fusion energy labs around the world. And in its stripped-down, more vague and optimistic appearance in more popular media, it's helping the rest of us get familiar with the idea. As Isaac Asimov said in an archival tape played on the Moonrise podcast, quote, No one is going to say that science fiction readers brought a man to the moon all by themselves. But we can say that the kind of science fiction that was published in 1940 helped prepare the public for the acceptance of programs to take a man to the moon. End quote. And the same might be said of fusion energy, or of so much technology and so many social changes, really. Neville Lee wrote in the prologue to his book Astounding, quote, Despite its darker and dystopian streak, science fiction offers a vision of the world into which many fans still long to escape. It reached maturity at a time of economic depression and war, in which there was no guarantee that the future would be bright. And it was uniquely positioned to provide America with the new mythology, or religion, that it needed. End quote. There's all kinds of criticism around the superhero movie franchises, and a discussion can certainly be had about the shifting market of the film industry and how it no longer invests in smaller, more innovative films the way it used to. But I think at least part of the popularity of those movies is that they take those adventure narratives we humans love and mixes in enough futuristic science to give us a sense of awe, and dare I say it, hope, for a future that doesn't always seem so certain. Well, full disclosure here, I had a last minute family thing come up this week and am recording these episodes for you in advance. And because apparently there are only so many hours in a day, I'm getting a little help from my friend the Cool Stuff Ride Home back catalog. So today and tomorrow, you'll get one or two new recent stories, plus one from a previous episode. It's part practicality and part that I really like the episodes I've made in December in past years, and I was kind of eager for an excuse to share them again. And honestly, even having written these myself, I was still surprised by how much in them I had forgotten. So even if you listened to these episodes in the past, you might still learn something new again upon re-listening. You know, I tend to think we don't do enough re-reading, re-watching, re-listening these days, with so much digital content constantly being pumped out. But that's another story for another day. 
Today, let's go back to December 3rd of last year and talk about Krampus, the origins and spread of that anti-Santa legend. His big day, Krampusnacht, has already passed for this year. It's celebrated on December 5th annually, but it's never too late to learn a little more about this fascinating mythical figure. Now, two things I want to note before I play the archival segment. First, at the end, I recommend a handful of festivals and events from 2021. Obviously, that's a bit outdated, but many of them are annual occurrences, so I kept that in there on the off chance that you want to look any of them up and bookmark them for 2023. Second, later on in the segment, I discuss Krampus Karten, greeting cards from the early 20th century produced by companies that featured Krampus abducting children, or in popular adult versions, showing Krampus seducing women. Well, more recently, I have discovered that there were yet more adult-oriented cards featuring a distinctly feminine Krampus seducing men who looked only too happy to be captured and beaten. I will link to some photos of those cards in the show notes so you can check them out. Nothing not safe for work, just a little saucy. And as one Austrian commenter on a post about some of these cards pointed out, these are not in any way traditional depictions of Krampus or Krampusnacht. They compared it to naughty Mrs. Claus pinups. You know, there's no lore in the Santa Claus story about naughty Mrs. Claus. Where depictions of that do exist, it's just a fun bit of art, or something made by a company to sell brandy or lingerie. Similarly, as the commenter said, quote, People treat it like a new, fun, scary thing, but for me, people who grew up going to Krampuslafa every year, this is a piece of my actual culture that has survived since before Christianity. End quote. And that push and pull between pre-Christian and enforced Christian traditions, as well as the spread of Krampus beyond his original roots, and how that story has gotten watered down as it spread, is exactly where this story from last year picks up. So here we go. So at the end of this upcoming weekend, there are a couple of holidays coming up that I wanted to mention ahead of time. Monday is St. Nicholas Day, and the night before that, Sunday night the 5th, is Krampusnacht. So St. Nicholas Day, or the Feast of St. Nicholas, is typically celebrated on December 5th or 6th by Western Christian cultures, and a bit later on the 19th in Eastern Christian cultures. And at its most basic, it is a day to honor the actual St. Nicholas from Mira, just like any other feast day for saints. But over the centuries, as the various legends of St. Nicholas evolved around the world, it became a day in which some children would receive presents or a visit from St. Nicholas who would determine whether they had behaved that year. For a time, this was completely separate from Christmas celebrations, which were about honoring Jesus. This was about honoring a popular saint. Things changed around the time of the Protestant Reformation in 16th century Europe as reformers sought to eliminate all traces of Catholicism from their communities and those they dominated. They knew they couldn't get rid of the very popular Christmas celebration, but their new religion didn't believe in the need for saints, so St. Nicholas would have to go. But to appease children, they decided to move the traditional gift-giving from St. Nicholas Day on the 6th to Christmas on the 25th and have Jesus visit the children instead of St. Nicholas. But as Professor Bruce David Forbes puts it in his Christmas A Candid History, quote, One problem was that the Christ child, sometimes portrayed by a little girl in a white dress or never seen at all, generated little excitement from children and families, and soon the Christ child was making the rounds with St. Nicholas or a replacement figure. In German, the child was known as the Christkindl, which later mutated in English to Kris Kringle, and in the United States eventually and ironically became yet another name for Santa Claus. Another problem was that the adult figures who emerged to replace St. Nicholas were often drawn from pre-Christian midwinter folklore that bothered some Protestants even more. In the words of one Christian commentator, turning away from St. Nicholas unleashed a host of semi-pagan pseudo-St. Nicholases. Instead of making the observance of Christmas more sacred, 
the reverse occurred. A bewildering array of characters emerged, either as replacements for St. Nicholas, or as his assistants, or as threatening counterparts who frightened children. Stand-ins for Nicholas himself included Weihnachtsmann, or Christmas Man in Germany, Old Man Winter in Finland, and Father Christmas in England. Sinterklaas held on tenaciously in the Netherlands, deflecting all substitutes. Other sometimes frightening winter visitors carried over from pre-Christian times included the witch-like Belfana in Italy, and both Knischt Ruprischt and Berchte in German lands." End quote. And just like the Protestant reformers did little to remove St. Nicholas or St. Nicholas-like figures from cultural traditions, their attempts at stamping out St. Nicholas Day also failed, even in predominantly Protestant communities. It's still an important holiday, especially in parts of Central Europe, and in the Netherlands it's arguably a bigger deal than Christmas itself, although media and advertising is attempting to change that. But going back to some of those St. Nicholas stand-ins, sidekicks, and foils, another one that Forbes didn't mention is one who occasionally accompanies St. Nicholas on the eve of celebrations, or stalks the town on his own, one you have no doubt heard about increasingly in recent years, Krampus. Or Krampus, if I were to pronounce it slightly more correctly. Krampus comes from Alpine folklore, and evolved over time to be a kind of anti-Santa Claus. He varies across cultures, time, and interpretations, but he is generally depicted as a dark, hairy, demonic figure with horns, cloven hooves, and an unsettlingly long tongue. He often comes bearing chains and sometimes bells, and almost always has a bundle of birch rods with which to beat naughty children. As a foil to jolly old Saint Nick, Krampus does have certain similarities. He appears at the same time to judge children on their behavior, of course, and in some versions even carries a large sack with him, although his is not filled with gifts, but is rather used to kidnap children so he can later eat them or drown them or drag them down to hell. But otherwise, you know, he's just like dear old Santa Claus. According to National Geographic, Krampus' name derives from the German word for claw, and he is sometimes considered to be the son of the Norse god Hel, ruler of Helheim, aka the underworld. And he can sometimes be conflated with or is thought to be an evolution of other folkloric figures. Most closely, Persden, but also figures like Knischt Ruprischt, Belsnickel, and the Dutch's uncomfortably racist Black Peter, who is somehow still commonly portrayed in blackface today. That is a whole other story. But Krampus has quickly become the most well-known of the alternative Yuletide characters globally. Traditional celebrations might go something like this, quoting Smithsonian Magazine, Young men in town dress up as the mythical figure and parade through the streets in an ancient pagan ritual meant to disperse winter's ghosts. They march dressed in fur suits and carved wooden masks and carrying cowbells. The tradition, also known as Krampuslauf or Krampus Run, is having a resurgence throughout Austria, Germany, Slovenia, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, and has gained recognition in the United States. End quote. But in many of those places these days, the Krampuslauf is more associated with drinking and devious revelry than ancient pagan rituals. Lots of festivals featuring all sorts of activities, some based in tradition and some just like goth versions of Christmas, are cropping up in towns all across Europe and North America. And as you might guess, that Krampus run has turned into actual runs, like 5K races in parts of the U.S., just like St. Nick, Krampus is not immune to commercialization. While there are recent critiques that Krampus is becoming too commercial, it's nothing new. Starting in 1890, Austrian companies began making Krampus-themed postcards that looked much like other holiday postcards of the time, but with the demonic goat man on them, often in the midst of torturing a child and with phrases printed on them reminding children to be good. The postcards, or Krampuskarten, grew in popularity over the next few decades up until the start of World War I, and they weren't just meant to be foreboding for children. They were sometimes comical or even romantic, showing Krampus in sensual scenarios with women. Quoting National Geographic, these adult cards seem to portray Krampus as kitsch or ironic long before Americans held their first Krampus bar crawl. End quote. 
And from a separate National Geographic article, quote, Krampus's frightening presence was suppressed for many years. The Catholic Church forbade the raucous celebrations, and fascists in World War II Europe found Krampus despicable because it was considered a creation of the Social Democrats. But Krampus has been having a resurgence over the past few years, thanks partly to a bah humbug attitude in pop culture, with people searching for ways to celebrate the Yuletide season in non-traditional ways, end quote. And with Krampus more popular than ever, if you want to celebrate this weekend, you have plenty of options to choose from. New Orleans is staging a full-on drive through Krampus-themed parade for the fifth year in a row. Just a bit northwest up in Shreveport, the necromancer Haunted House is extending their haunted season by offering photos with Krampus, a play on kids' pictures with Santa. There's also a Krampus Fest in Orlando, a family-friendly Krampusnacht festival in Milwaukee, and a Krampus pageant in San Francisco, hosted by the amazing Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, with proceeds going to Trans Lifeline and the Trevor Project. You can also get a 12 Days of Krampus craft beer package from Southern Star Brewing Company in Houston. Limited supplies are available at a few chain stores like Specs and Total Wine, but you're probably going to need to be local to the tap room in Conroe to really get your hands on a box. And of course, you can watch the 2015 horror comedy film Krampus, directed by Michael Dougherty and starring Adam Scott and Tony Collette. And apparently there is an extended R-rated Blu-ray edition coming out on the 7th called Krampus, The Naughty Cuts. The original cut out a few scenes and dialogue so it could get a PG-13 rating, so I would expect more gore, more swearing, and maybe a bit more of the dark lore. So if you've been bummed that Halloween is over or just want to do something a bit different for the holidays this year, Krampus could be your answer. Well, that is going to be it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.